Hello and welcome back to Catching Patterns, our little series here on open source design patterns, how they emerge, and uh, how they become conventions throughout an entire ecosystem. Uh, I'm your host, Mahmoud Hashemi, and today we'll be picking up uh, right where we left off last time, in the middle of the Boltons uh, old open source utility library, a little library that I wrote and continue to maintain to this day. Um, we were in the middle of cache utils, actually. And uh, if you look here, uh, we were about to look at the LRU. Now, you couldn't see this last time. All you could see, I think we left off right here. All we knew was that the LRU, which is the least recently used uh, cache, uh, inherited from the LRI, uh, or least recently inserted cache. This didn't used to always be the case. This was a recent refactor and uh, led to some interesting discoveries uh, that you know we sort of partake in together, you and me. Uh, anyways, um, but yeah, big thanks to Cameron for that refactor. I'd forgotten until I started recording, um, but as I think you saw, it was pretty clear and straightforward, good software all around. Um, but yeah, today is about the LRU, and uh, I think uh, you're going to like the twist on this one. But basically, as we look at the doc string here, we have the args, uh, max size, values, on miss. Um, these should all be familiar if you saw the last uh, entry. Uh, we got a little example doc string uh, in our doc string here. It's a doc test. Uh, you can see that um, we add a couple of values to the cache, uh, which has a max size of two. When we go to add the third entry in that cache, that first entry is long gone. So, um, you know, this cache is also instrumented with statistics. We talked about that last time. If you're going to do caching, always gather statistics. Otherwise, how are you going to know if your cache is working for you? Um, but, uh, yeah, what's this right here? Uh, let's see. I mean, we got one method, and all of a sudden, we're done with the class. And... Like I said, it didn't used to always be this way, but the LRU is actually a very small type looking at just uh, this level in the inheritance tree. The get item um, does that familiar uh, self dot get link and move to front of LL linked list, um, and that's about it. You know, everything else is actually covered by that parent LRI type. And that's because when you think about how an LRI works, an LRU uh, really only has this one semantic difference. So this is one case where, you know, we talked about it at length, but this is one case where inheritance, that classic, you know, pattern of yore, uh, sort of slightly maligned in, uh, you know, today's modern software development process, uh, actually has uh, demonstrated its value. Um, you know, the LRI is a sizable class and it inherits from the dict, and a lot of work went into making it be a you know suitable inheritor to the auspicious dict type, uh, and then the LRU all it had to do is swing in and slightly change the get item behavior. It's locked, moves it to the front of the linked list, collects some statistics, and then returns the value. Really, nothing more to it. Uh, so while I could end the episode right there. There's actually a lot more to the cache utils module, but I just want to take a quick moment here and just appreciate inheritance actually doing a little bit of something positive for once. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we'll probably do an episode on this later, but, uh, you know, lest I come across too much a fan of inheritance, inheritance as an API for your library users is not quite as so much something to be celebrated. All right. Okay, so now that we've appreciated the brevity of LRU, I think we're ready to look at the rest of the cache utils module. Because, uh, if, you know, if you look, we're only about 40% through the module right now. So uh, there's a lot more to be uh, appreciated here. All right, so in the last episode, I talked about how uh, basically the LRI and LRU being the premier cache types in uh, Bolton's cache utils are actually sort of cribbing some stuff from the uh, Python base, uh, like, you know, standard library LRU that is in func utils, or func tools, rather. 
Um, so in Python 3, they added LRU to the standard library, except it was added only as a function decorator. And so it would cache the input and output of that, uh, or it would make a key of the input, as we'll see, and return a cached output in the appropriate uh, situations. So yeah, Python has this built-in one, but I kind of wasn't a huge fan of the API there because I had all these other applications for caching um, and I didn't really feel like rephrasing them into, be fu into being function calls. I wanted that classic Python mapping dict sort of interface. Um, but that said, making a uh, function cache is a super common use case. So that's where sort of I had to go looking at uh, Raymond Hedinger's approach in the standard library and sort of um, bring it in with maybe a couple of innovations. I feel like I changed something, but I don't really know for sure. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. But uh, right now, let's sort of appreciate here uh, yet another application of uh, a pattern that we saw last time, but with a slightly different twist here. Uh, here, we have a hashed key type, which is used to create the key from a uh, sort of like function uh, call down below. You know, we're going to make a cached function. Uh, and here, um, what's a little bit different is that the hash key is actually its own type and it inherits from list. So rather than just instantiating a list, it is uh, basically a list subtype that gets used as a lightweight, uh, lightweight object. And here we see that it's especially lightweight because it actually has dunder slots defined, which means that any instances of this type won't have a dunder dict, making it even smaller. So, uh, like if we didn't have that, then not it, it would inherit from list, but it would also get a sort of dict uh, instance per instance of the hashed key. And uh, you know, Raymond's smart guy, he doesn't want that. Okay. So how does this hashed key type get used? I think that'll be elucidated down here in the make cache key function. So this make cache key uh, signature is really interesting. It takes args, positional arguments, quargs, keyword arguments. It takes a flag as to whether or not something is, uh, whether or not we should um, do a typed key. That's kind of a nuance we'll get into in a second. And here we see a quark mark. Now, um, the quark mark here is a uh, basically like it's we're using a sentinel like we introduced last time. The underscore quark mark is a singleton in this module, um, and then we have uh, fast fast types. Um, so, yeah, fast types is pretty interesting. I think we'll see how that works below. Um, keep in mind that these are basically all, like if you sort of look at these, you can get a sense for what they are. This is a set of immutable built-ins, ints, strings, frozen sets, and none. Uh, we could probably expand that list, and that's sort of why I think it's an argument here. Although it could also be for performance reasons. Raymond likes to put a lot of stuff in the arguments. Uh, okay. so. I think that's why quark mark is in the arguments, honestly. <laughs> um, right. So this is actually a pretty uh, tricky function, and that's sort of why I, um, you know, took it from func tools in Python 3.4. Let's get it all on the screen here, and start going down line by line. So we start out with our key, you know, uh, key being kind of the primary deliverable of this function which is going to be a list. And we basically just make a copy of the args that were passed in into this list. If there are keyword arguments, we're going to extend uh, our key with a sorted list of the items from those keyword arguments. Sorted because, remember, we're trying to make a hash here. We want it to be very consistent. Uh, so we go ahead and add the quark mark. Um, that sentinel, and then we extend uh, our key with the sorted items. So we have positional arguments, then we have the quark mark, which is sort of akin to 
a bare star star in a Python 3 that has uh, keyword only arguments. And then we have the actual quarks. Um, furthermore, uh, so, so far we have those sort of three groupings of things in our nice flat uh, lists in our key. Uh, and then, if it's uh, typed, then we're going to basically slap all the types of all the arguments and so forth onto the end of that key. And uh, this is sort of a, um, this is sort of a, I guess like a nice to have. I mean, I, I need to go see where this is used, but as you can see, typed is false by default. So maybe let's not worry about this branch for the moment. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward in any case. Uh, so, and then there's actually a case here where if something's not, yeah, if something's not typed, if typed's false, which is the default, um, and there's only one thing in the key so far, right, either one argument or one, uh, probably not one keyword argument, just one argument, uh, and the type is one of those immutable types that we saw in the signature above, then we're going to have the key be the thing itself. The point of a hash is we want something immutable uh, that is, you know, highly reproducible. And if something's immutable, then it's already that thing for us. Um, but in any case, if it's not one of those fast types, we're going to use that hashed key type that we saw above, and we're actually going to um, pass uh, the keys that we get, the the key items that we gathered so far, to that, and it'll compute the hash value for us. So let's pop back up to that hash key and see how it gets used. Looks like it it uh, basically copies all of the values of that key list that we passed in into itself. This is kind of funky looking, but uh, basically makes a copy of everything in that list into self. It's very it's kind of rare that you see that notation. Um, but that's a that's a list copy right there, and then. It uh, computes the hash using the hash function built in. Um, it's not cryptographic hash. It's just a uh, you know a hash that generates an integer, and it, and it got that integer uh, from hashing a tuple copy of the key. So um, turns that list into a tuple, hashes that, saves it as the sole attribute of this hashed key lightweight object. All right, so. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, that's how make cache key works. And now that we have a way to make a cache key, we're finally ready to make that um, cached function in the same way uh, that like the Python built-in uses cached function. So uh, Python like standard library, I should say, not the built-in. Uh, OK. So this cached function uh, type here just sort of stores it. it this cat, I mean, how else to explain this? This cached function type is actually a callable object. Instances of this type are callable. And then um, basically, uh, you can use it directly if you want. You can see it's a public uh, thing, but it's a little bit tricky to use. Uh, Let's actually jump ahead real quick so you can see how to use it. I think it'll be a little bit more obvious then. Um, so, right. So, like I said, we're making a decorator uh, that has all the functionality of the Funk Tools uh, standard library LRU cache decorator, but we are making it so that you can sort of swap in any cache type you want. In this case, LRU or LRI and um, anything that sort of matches their uh, dictionary uh, interface. So theoretically, you could probably pass in a normal dictionary. But um, you instantiate your cache, and then you pass it into this cached uh, function decorator here. And then uh, we have our little like lower function that is sort of our toy function that we're caching. And then... Uh, you know, when we call cached lower, caching's fun again, right? We can actually see that our cache has been populated from that function call. So hopefully this stock test here makes it kind of clear how uh, we're using that, um, you know, caching decorator. Now, 
This is actually an all-time great pattern right here, uh, in case you haven't already spotted it. But this is a sort of way of inverting the dependency, dependency inversion. And um, what's happening here is that rather than making the cached uh, decorator responsible for creating the cache, you actually create the cache, pass that in, and uh, the cached decorator stays a lot simpler um, and in a way uh, can be much more powerful because it can take a bunch of different kinds of cache types. So um, I guess uh, this is like my primary critique of the LRU cache that's built into the standard library while implemented phenomenally, right? It actually sort of tightly binds the particular LRU implementation, uh, the particular uh, cache implementation to that decorator uh, interface of exposing it. Um, yeah. As for the, but back to the code here, uh, as for the actual implementation of the uh, cached decorator here, you can see it's very short. All it does, it is a decorator, so um, it, this is actually a decorator that takes arguments as well. Uh, we can probably do several episodes on Python decorators if we really want to look into some of the great examples out there. But uh, this one takes a few arguments and then um, it basically binds them in via the closure <laughs> uh, to um, this, uh, like, you know, cached method uh, type here, which we didn't really talk about specifically, but it's right above. Um, and then it returns that. Um, that's actually for cached method as opposed to cached function. Yeah, here we go. I got a little bit turned around there. Uh, cached function uh, works the exact same way. So cached method, cached function, you can guess what they're for. Um, cached, fu cached works on functions, cached method works on methods, uh, instances of uh, objects. And here you can see another example here. Same basic example where it's like, you know, we're caching a function that does lower casing. Uh, but here that, that function is actually a method. Uh, and so we make a lowerer type. And then that uh, lowerer type has a lower uh, method on it that we cache. And uh, the cool thing about this is that the cache is actually a, uh, in this case, a attribute as well of that lowerer. And so the cached method, all it takes here is rather than the actual instance of the cache, it takes the attribute name of that cache on the instance of the object, if that makes sense. If you need it, then it makes sense. Uh, if not, then probably you just want to focus on this cache thing because that's what does the most similar thing to the Python standard library one. Okay, so yeah, that is basically, I think, probably another good stopping point here uh, because what we've seen is the LRI in the previous episode, the LRU in this episode, and the cache decorator, which is sort of part of the reason for the season, actually, right? It sort of ties it all together and sort of via dependency inversion uh, gives you sort of a nice two-part system where if you just need the cache object you have a dictionary interface and you can use that and if you want uh, you know function caching you can get that by combining the cache object with a decorator through that wonderful dependency inversion pattern so yeah uh, you know thanks again for tuning in and if you like what you see then check out the links in the description below and we'll take it up next time Thanks again.